In today's socially connected and fast-paced world, you will want to succeed and stand out from the competition. Your host, Jonathan Butler, is an award-winning chef, restauranteur and author and is known for shaking up the everyday within our highly competitive industry. Welcome to the Disruptive Restauranteur Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Disruptive Restauranteur. I'm John Butler and with me today I've got Rob McMillan who is the founder of Operalis. How are we doing Rob? Yeah, very good John. Great to meet you. And you. Uh, obviously only virtually today so uh, we are doing our social distancing. I'm recording this online. So. Absolutely. <laughs> right, so um, Rob, tell us a bit of, bit of your background. Tell us all about uh, Operalis and then you know we can chat away. So yeah, what awesome. No problem. Yeah, so Operalis was founded just this year um, as a result of I'd spent five years in the industry, in the te- technical industry around restaurants, um, and uh, effectively running across a different, uh, multiple different types of services, um, online ordering, integrations for POS, delivery. And what I realized was that there were lots of suppliers in the market, providers in the market, uh, or cloud providers, software providers that were providing these services directly to restaurants. But actually, if you're a restaurateur, especially if you're, you know, you're a single single unit operator, um, you're probably not very tech savvy, um, certainly not around the areas of understanding how the technology fits into your business operationally. So I thought, you know what, the world I came from many, many years ago was telecoms and IT. And um, you'd have a model where you'd have a reseller, you called it a reseller, and he'd go in there and or he or she would go in there and and you'd evaluate the operation of a particular business based on, you know, um, how it operates. Um, yeah. Understanding, you know, sort of the, the red markers, the challenges that different operations face, the different divisions in the business face. And then ultimately what you'd do is you'd create a document, which would be a high level recommendation document. And you'd give that back to the customer, the client, and they would then evaluate and make a decision as to where they want to move forward. Now, that could be one particular stream of technology or it could be multiple streams depending on uh the the the, the kind of um the, the state of the business at that particular time now in the restaurant industry um there are as you'll see from my home page there are there's been an explosion of software applications from online ordering pay at table beacon technology for facial recognition delivery do you want to outsource your delivery do you want to manage your own de- delivery um, kiosks there are so many technologies, it's almost like a minefield for restaurateurs. And what we try and do at Operalis is we try and make sense of that for people to say, let's just do a bit of a health check on your business. It's not an extensive process. You're talking like 30 minutes just to say, look, yeah. let's talk about your business. Um, how do you operate? Does and, and things like fundamental things like, for example, does your food travel well? So we know pizza travels well because it has a tomato base, which re- remains hot. It's a good conductor of heat, so pizza travels particularly well. We know the same of Chinese and Indian food. Um, high water content, therefore, it retains the food. We also know that chips don't travel well. I mean, the burgers don't travel well, especially if you've got the wrong type of packaging, because typically stuff sweats. So it's these sort of things that we take into account when we engage with our clients to make sure that they understand operationally how successful they would be if they deploy certain technologies uh, and because, you know, obviously online ordering and delivery, the byproduct of that is you're actually going to sell more food, but you're going to, it's going to be, it's going to be delivered. And therefore, yeah. is there a, an impact or a compromise on the quality of your product? We don't want that. So in that case, we probably advise against it. But we would look at other things like, for example, you've got a big footprint restaurant and you're particularly busy at lunch times. Would you like your, uh, your, your customers to order online or via a kiosk? So they can jump the queue, uh, and therefore, you know, obviously, you you benefit from the optimization of resources um, rather than running, you know, with eight staff, you run with six or four, uh, and just prepare prepare the food rather than actually serving clients. So it's lots of lots of different things to look at, but 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 what we're looking at is an advisory service. We don't charge for our advice. Um, we make a we make a margin on the services that we provide through our suppliers. Yeah. That's how it operates. Yeah. That's that's the mate. Well, I say obviously a, a, a great you know great. I you know certainly I can understand completely because I, I've been to some of these kind of restaurant shows and stuff where you know let's just take 
EPOS as an example, mm. um, you, you could have 10 or 15 suppliers at, at one one show. Um, yeah. And fundamentally, you probably think that every single one does exactly the same thing. But I suppose mm. there is there is differences to every single system, isn't there? There are. I mean, you know, if, if you take POS as an example, you know, there are there are the, the variations are on site POS. There are cloud based POS. There are POS that's provided that doesn't give you um, a, a backup, an online backup. So, for example, if your Wi-Fi goes down, you can't any longer take orders. Um, so that's a big issue. There's some that have an integrated chip and pin. Others don't have any integration with payment devices. Um, there are some that are charged on a on a capital basis. So if you've got a budget and you can fork out fifteen, twenty thousand pounds, we'll give you a bunch of POS uh, with software. There's others that operate £49 a month on an iPad. Um, so it really depends on the operation, the size of the operation, and also the integrations. You know, are you looking to integrate to labour management and to workforce management? Uh, do you want to integrate your delivery, Just Eat and Uber Eats orders coming into your restaurant? Do you want to integrate them to the POS to make sure that you're not having to manually transpose information from a tablet to the POS terminal, which not only costs money from a resource perspective, but also is very open to a lot of human error. And of course, human error means wrongly cooked food, which means food in the bin. Um, so POS, POS is a bit of a minefield. And in the UK, there's something like 65 different POS providers. So when you're in the market for a new POS, it's, uh, yeah, it's a lot. I mean, it's a lot, right? It's huge. And, and they're all looking on your door trying to sell you a unit. So yeah. Again, and a lot, a lot say this is, be- is, is better than the last one that you mentioned. Like, oh yeah, yeah. I've looked at this. Oh yeah. no, no, well, our system doesn't. Our system does this, whereas theirs doesn't do that. And this, like that. so, yeah, yeah. I, and, and that's yeah. what I mean. Right? So I totally, you know, th- this is the thing. I think it's, you know, I, I suppose it can get quite overwhelming for people when they start to look into this, and 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 as uh, you sort of mentioned, I think that you know, making the wrong decision at that point. Mm. Um, is probably quite, you know, can, can be quite detrimental to the business in the longer term because, um, you know, if you if, if you're investing, you know, into a, 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 an EPOS system, at, you know, at the start of your business, and in six to twelve months you realise actually that was the wrong system, mm. you know, you've either got to make the decision of oh we stick with it, but knowing it's actually not really working and doing the job as efficiently and as you know as, as it could be. Or you bite the bullet and you reinvest into the next system, you know, yeah, and hope that you make the the, the right decision second time round, yeah, um, which can be incredibly expensive. And you know, bit bit of a side point is, but I was watching um, Dragons Den last night, and there was a woman on there who had, um, she was, uh, she designed a a, a a piece of clothing that, that attached into co- coats it was for um, baby carrying. Um, mm. But she had wasted like thirty odd thousand pounds on tooling because she got it wrong the first time round. Right, um, right. Their systems they needed tooling. So again, it's that similar kind of process. If you get it wrong the first time, round, it can become incredibly expensive. Yeah, um, completely. So, so, so it, it's a good idea to really, and at some point, people might just think, "Oh, well, you know, it's a, an EPOS system." You know, completely, John. As, as I said, they, they all do the same, don't they? But they don't. They like, will. They... The thing is with EPOS is, you know, again, harking back to my days in telecoms, you know, the t- telephone system, if you bought a telephone system in the in the 90s, you know, you're putting a box on the wall and hanging a load of telephones off it with cables. And that has a depreciation of between 10 and 15 years. So when you buy it, um, you know, you, you're in for the long run, regardless of what features and functionality you thought it had. If it doesn't, it's too late. And it's the same with EPOS. You know, EPOS is holds the high ground in in the sector. So everything hangs off the back of it. So what you find is that all the EPOS guys have lots of integrations to different applications. Um, and if you make the wrong decision up front and you and you buy a unit that where you know the, the product team in that particular manufacturer are not developing more features, functionality, and integrations, you're stuck with it. You are mm-hmm. stuck with it. And you know, and that's whether you even if you buy you buy a cloud-based product, um, which is low cost per month, you know you're typically going to be in a contract, and that contract's going to be extensive. Um, and then what you've done is you've trained all your staff on how to use that particular software. Come to the realization that actually this isn't fit for purpose, 
I have to change it and retrain all your staff again, which yeah. in a single unit isn't a big problem, but in a multi-unit, it's a big problem. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Getting it right is important. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all, but like I say, it's also, you know, you could start with a single unit, but you might be thinking, well, you know, in three to five years, I want to have two, three, four restaurants. So yeah. it could be that you need to have a system that's going to grow with, you know, with the business. So then you can obviously, you know, integrate all together. So uh, that's, that, that's interesting. And and obviously you talked, you know, we talk about things like where, where things are going, you know, obviously online ordering and kiosks, you know, kiosks is quite an interesting one. You think, you know, I, I you know, maybe it's just because I've got two two kids, but I only tend to see them in McDonald's. Um, <laughs> yeah. You kind of think, is it is that only for the big companies? But you know, I suppose more and more, you know, even independent takeaways, mm. you know, benefit from kiosks. Yeah, they can. I think for me, it's probably a subjective thing. But I, if I go into a particular QSR, I mean, let's talk QSR fast casual. Um, and I'm going to order, and I want to order before I get to the counter so that I'm in a queue. You know, KFC, Burger King, McDonald's, they're all doing it now, especially in service stations, for example. But what I don't want to do is have a bad experience. I don't want to go to a wall, find an iPad, and have to navigate my way through complex software. What I want is a very big unit with when I can select food with my whole hand rather than my fingertip. And I, and I want it to be a simplistic customer journey is the most important thing for me. And, um, and that to me is what kiosk is all about. You know, if you want to give someone an iPad, give them an app and let them use it on the smartphone, don't, don't give them kiosk. So we're talking here about, you know, purpose made, very large kiosks that have a hardware um, component as well as software. Uh, and I think it's more relevant where you have, cues we are a takeaway um you know the likes of five guys for example would, would benefit from kiosks i believe um they have online ordering they uh they have apps but they have big queues at lunchtime you know especially in the tourist areas so rather than have a healthy 10 or 15 people in the queue you end up with 30 people in the queue and then you lose the back half because it's lunchtime and people don't have time to wait um so I think kiosk in that kind of environment where food is made to order um, is, 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 is a great, is a great benefit. It, it, it's quite important. You say, you know, it's got to fit the environment, hasn't it? Because yeah. it's, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty unsightly really, aren't they? They're, they are. they're not the prettiest they thing. No. And like I said, I, I think I agree. I, I have been to some places where they do just have, like I say, the iPads on the, you know, I think you find it a lot in London with the sort of smaller, um, you know, kind of wrap type takeaway types that, you know, whether it's yeah. sort of maybe a Leon and things like that, sort of where it's mm. very, very quick, quick, so, you know, just to, but it, it's, they've probably got quite a big menu on quite a small sort of screen. And I think, like you say, it's about that simplicity, whereas, you know, and you understand when you go into a McDonald's and you see it there and it's huge and it's right in your face, you can't, you can't miss them. In fact, you've got to dodge them to even now get to the counter, don't you? You've probably got to even see the counter because of these huge screens. Yeah. Because they probably benefit of actually, you know, if we can get most people ordering on those, like you say, you've suddenly freed up, you know, somebody stood at a till or two people stood at a till or three people stood at tills, you know, um, and they can be obviously serving and, and making, you know, uh, doing the other bits that actually getting the, getting the money and getting it out, isn't it? So Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. It's all about streamlining. And that's, and that's why, you know, is is the you know, do you think that over time that these are going to be improved that in terms of that their looks will be better or that they will fit more into places? I think the cha- the challenge for the industry really is the pulling together of a turnkey what we would class as a turnkey solution, which is effectively the software, the hardware components, the chip and pin, the printer, pulling everything together and putting it into a purpose made unit is difficult. And, you know, you have to find companies out there that actually do this stuff um, and then brand it to your own particular restaurant brand. That's, mm. that's the difficulty. Um, and, of course, different footprints demand different types of hardware. So in the, in the case of McDonald's, for example, you've got very, very large screens of a metre high, half a metre wide. You know, they just won't work in a small unit in central London. Um, no. So you have to scale appropriately. And. You know, um, what we have as Operalis is that we have our hooks into a number of different providers that provide kiosk technology uh, as a turnkey solution. Because the last thing you want to be doing is going to a, an online ordering provider and saying, 
I want kiosk. You know, these guys are all about getting fast footprint um, and they just won't entertain the pulling together of technologies uh, into a single cohesive unit. But there are companies out there that will do that. So um, again, we, we, would, we would help the particular brand to hook into these guys and, um, and create a specific solution for, for their brand. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's quite, that's quite. In terms of then the online ordering, obviously that's that's then different to mm. the kiosk system. So, so you know, where where do you see that kind of you know where where have you kind of seen the advances and the improvements in online ordering over the last sort of you know couple of years? It's interesting. Online ordering is a bit of again an interesting area um, for for restaurants. Uh, there's obviously the elephants in the room, and these are the Deliveroo's, the Just Eats, the Uber Eats, the food aggregators. Uh, and I think you know, when these guys first came around five, six years ago, actually longer in the case of Just Eats, I think restaurants just saw it as a kind of enormous bluebird, you know, give me a printer, turn it on, orders will come. I don't think what they realised over time is that the control that these guys would have over their businesses. I mean, firstly, just as a concept, um, an aggregator putting a tablet or printer into a restaurant to say, just accept the orders, um, you all, you become a kitchen and, and a slave to that aggregator. That's the first thing. So you're literally a kitchen. And if that's how you want to operate your business, that's absolutely fine. And that's very, very, works very well for a lot of brands. No problem. Other brands, especially ones that actually invest in their profile, say, well, hold on a minute. How do I drive loyalty to my clients? And the answer is you can't because the data is owned by the aggregators. So um, what you end up with in a, is a business that's successful, but but gives up 25% as a minimum. Uh, like to, to the <laughs> yeah, it can be, well, it can be 30% yeah. if you're non-exclusive, but you know, up to 30% of your revenue. Now this isn't even your margin, this is your revenue um, at, at for, for becoming a kitchen to deliver room. I mean, that's effectively what you're becoming. Um, and you don't have any control. They're not your customers. They're Deliveroo's customers. They drive the demand. Uh, and so if you wanted to drive loyalty schemes, if you want to put in, you know, um, if you want to entice them into, into point systems, uh, if you want to understand the profile of your customer to make sure that you're, you're putting forward offers that are aimed at particular demographics um, or genders, you can't do any of that because you don't know who they are. All you get is a name and a, and a, and a, a phone number um, and the order. Uh, but again, legally, if you look at the contract, you know you're, you, they're not your customers anymore. Now, yeah. the question is, were they once your customers that you, you could drive loyalty and now have now become Deliveroo's customers or Just Eat's customers? That's the answer. So what, what online ordering does for you, providing your own online ordering on your own website gives, brings, gives you control back. So effectively means that if a consumer is if a consumer is on Deliveroo, then what they'll probably do is go, what do I fancy tonight? And they'll pick a particular food concept that is Chinese, Indian pizza, whatever they fancy. Yep. They won't necessarily be loyal to that particular brand. They might they might look at all the Chinese restaurants in their area and go, do you know what? We've all used this one in the past. We'll use this one again. That's fine. But actually, will they go... I want a specific shop on the high street that we've used for years and years and years. Let's see if it's on Deliveroo. Now, if it's not on Deliveroo, the chances are they'll go to their website. And if they go to the website, they'll find there's an online ordering uh, facility. They can register a credit card and they can place an order. The order gets delivered in the same way. And probably orders that are placed directly on a website cost the store less. And yep. therefore, they're more likely to prioritize you because they want to keep you on that on that yeah, um, yeah. on their website rather than going back to one of the aggregators. So online or your own online ordering has a lot of power. If you can move your consumers past and present and future clients away from the aggregators and onto your own online ordering, there's a massive financial benefit um, and there's a massive loyalty benefit in terms of data retention. The downside is if you have no intentions of if you're if you're doing delivery and you've no intentions of ever running your own riders, then you have no choice. You have to you have to deliver it. I suppose that, that this becomes the, the 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 thing, though, isn't it? So I suppose it's the it's almost. Uh, I think with, with delivery and 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 you just eat some new breeds and stuff. I think what a lot of businesses have done is they said, well, you know, because a lot of our competition are doing it, we just need to do it as well. So they kind of just throw themselves on there, but don't really kind of put 
the effort and the you know emphasis on that it's just kind of like yeah if we get some orders in then fine if we don't then it's not a, a big loss but mm. actually what you're going to say with on if you're going to go down your own online ordering route it, it becomes another aspect of your business so it has to be treated with, with the same respect as as actually if we've got customers coming into the restaurant and 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 serving them in the restaurant we need to be you know spending time and effort on ensuring that our online ordering is as good a customer experience as if you come into the restaurant and, and like I say, then you can almost create a much um, stronger comparison mm. with, with two. And, and, you know, I, I personally, I think that there's a much better case. And we, we were having the conversation before we started recording that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit against the deliveries, et cetera, et cetera, because I think they take away the, the whole point and, an ethos of you setting up a restaurant and 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 having you know uh, customers coming in and and well trained staff and everything else. It just it, it's almost you ha- like, as you said you're handing control over to you know somebody who let's be honest is you know coming in on a, on a bike. Um, you know then they they're coming in walking in through the restaurant with delivery or whatever branding on them, um, and all they're bothered about is getting your food out as quick as they can get the next one because they're on very very low pay and probably being paid per delivery rather than you know kind of a, a, a any other any other sort of system yeah and i think for me if you can create more of a branding cohesiveness of, of well our delivery is is you know like i say we do it our own in-house stuff else, then then like i say it, there should be much more financial benefits and that ability for you to deliver more of your brand values directly to the customer, even if they're eating at home, than than if they're eating than as they would get when they're eating in your restaurant. Yeah. Um. So my question yeah. is, it would would be, you know, a lot of people are probably thinking, well, my own online ordering, that's going to be expensive. Is it is it relatively expensive to do these days? No. Well, it's, well, it depends how you view it, I suppose. Um. You know, nothing's free. Everything, everything has a cost. Um, just going back to the delivery thing, John. Before we move on to that, just uh, yeah. there is another very, very good option of running delivery. Yeah. So, in my previous job, uh, I say job, previous role, um, I <clears throat> came to the realization very quickly that if you're providing online ordering, you need to have delivery with it. You know, one goes with the other because actually, click and collect has very limited appeal. People typically don't want to place an order for food they're going to collect especially from a takeaway, they're prepared to wait 10 minutes for the food to be there. So um, only on, in very extreme circumstances, you know, like using five guys as a good example, where you might want to avoid that 20, 30 person queue, you might want to place an order in advance and go straight to the collection point. But that, that's kind of rare. Um, the, for us, the best option, um, if you want to circumnavigate the cost of running with a delivery, for example, is to run your own online ordering but then have an integration. And when I say integration, I mean a fully automated integration into a third-party delivery company. Now, again, uh, there are several out there, several, um, there are companies like Stuart, for example, French company who have riders in pretty much every major conurbation in the UK. And, and the way you can operate is you have your consumers coming into your online ordering via your website or through your own mobile app. Uh, and then when the order is placed, exactly the same way as Deliveroo or Uber Eats operate, exactly the same way. You place the order, the order goes through to the store, either on a tablet or it goes directly into the POS via the integration. And then uh, the order simultaneously in parallel gets sent out to the delivery company. Now the delivery company, because they're directly contracted to the restaurant, even though they're an outsource, Mm -hmm. they have, there are uh, service level agreements in place and there is an element of control that the restaurant has over the outsourcer whereas you don't with Deliveroo. Because remember, you're just a kitchen for Deliveroo and the consumer is their customer, not yours. So what we do is we remove all the control away from the likes of the third party operators, the the food aggregators. We give it back to you and you have the ability to deliver deliver to your customer without having to employ riders, which I think is the thing that majority of restaurant brands want to avoid. They don't want the responsibility of, oh, I've got no orders, but I'm still paying riders. Hmm. So, this is a, another a really, really great way. And even and we've even used taxi companies in the past. So 
you know, if you're a restaurant in uh, in, in the middle of a town, uh, well, you live in Gloucester, right? I mean, you live in, in that sort of area. So imagine you have a restaurant in Evesham. You can pretty much guarantee that Uber Eats and Deliveroo don't operate in Evesham. They might do. I'd be surprised. But you might have an Indian restaurant that wants to deliver or a Chinese or a, any form of takeaway that wants to deliver food. We can put outsourced riders into that town as long as there's enough volume to satisfy one or two riders on busy periods. Mm-hmm. So, again, it's a good option. It's a great option for, for restaurants wanting to deliver but not wanting the cost of operating through the aggregators. Yeah. yeah. On to online order. Um, sorry, on to yeah, online ordering is expensive. Um, it depends. There are lots of providers out there and they all have a different model. So some of them will charge a commission, um, typical commission somewhere between 5 and 8% as opposed to 30% you're paying delivery. But remember, you're responsible for getting food to the client um, yeah. with an upfront cost of somewhere between 200 and 300 pounds, something like that, to set up the site in the first place. But that will include a tablet or a printer. Um, uh, other other providers will provide for you at a, a, somewhere between £49 and £180 a month per store, depending on the level of functionality you want. So if you want an integration into your POS, for example, it's going to be more expensive. If you're happy to operate out off a tablet, it's going to be cheaper, but then you've got the cost of resource. Mm-hmm. So um, there are options. And again, you know, hopefully what Operalis can do for you is, is make sense of those options. Um, we have relationships with about eight different online ordering providers. Uh, they typically provide their services into different sectors. Um, so depending on the sector you operate in, uh, will be depend on and, and also the model, you know, the commercial model you want to you want to adopt. Um, then we would put you in, in touch with the, with the right supplier for the right service. Um, but I don't, you know, if you're confident you can get your, your own consumers onto your website and through your own order, ordering platform, I don't consider it to be expensive. I think it's an inexpense. Um, there are companies, Chinese restaurants and Japanese restaurants in London doing around £120,000 uh, transactions on a weekend, in one weekend, through their own okay. online ordering that cost them £275 a month. So, so you know, it, it can be very lucrative. You've got a market, you've got a leaflet your area, you've got to, you know, you've got to be very proactive in getting people onto your platform. But, um, and, and what those guys do is they use Deliveroo between Monday and Thursday. And then Friday to Sunday, they use their own online ordering. Another oh, option. Yeah. yeah. And I suppose that is, that, like you say, that's it. It's, it's having that almost that hybrid, you know, in between sort of model. Um, and like I say, knowing your business and knowing, like I say, well, we know we're going to be quiet on a, you know, say Monday to Wednesday or whatever it might be. Therefore, yeah, yeah you know, we just, we, we just utilize them for that period. But like I say, when, when you're then much busier, you know, you can, you can focus on it. And it, it, it's, yeah. as I said before, it, it becomes that taking it more seriously. So if you are going to invest into, you know, your own online ordering, then, then take it seriously and drive some, you know, like I say, you've got to start to drive traffic into that system, don't you? So it's then, yeah. you know, you can do, you know, whether it be utilizing Facebook and things like that and, um, and absolutely Instagram and all these sort of things of, of sort of how do we drive people into our own, you know, um, sort of system rather than them thinking, oh, well, we'll just go on delivery or, or just eat whatever and find, um, you know, find somewhere that, that does, you know, what you do. So, you know, I, mm. I, yeah, I, I certainly see, you know, I, but I, I think it is, it's, it is that more taking it more seriously rather than it just being a, you know, oh, well, we have to do it because everybody else is sort of doing it type type model. Absolutely, so, yeah. Um, so we kind of covered most of, you know, stuff there. It, obviously, the next thing, I suppose, it, you know, we'll, we'll talk a bit about where, where things are going in a minute. But mm. um, last thing I was going to sort of ask you about is obviously sort of payment sort of systems. Do you, you know, obviously you, you look at payment systems as well. You know, there's obviously been a change in, in the way that we're paying for stuff. Is that, do you think that, are restaurants keeping up with that or is is there stuff that restaurants need to be doing to improve how, how they actually are taking money? Well, well, I mean, you know, John, payments again. Uh, if you thought there was lots of pause, there's lots of payments. I mean, 
there's so many providers out there. You've now got Google Pay and Apple Pay that have come into the market in the last year or so. Um, so contactless is becoming very prevalent. I see lots of restaurants now with, uh, or particularly takeaways, with, with contactless only, so no cash at all. I'm seeing that a lot. Um, so I think in, in those circumstances, you know, having an integrated chip and pin to your pause is really important. Uh, for example, there are there are wide class as traditional providers out there, the World Pays, the Barclay Cards, the MasterCards, and then you've got the more kind of innovative payment providers uh, like Payment Sense, for example, iZettle, um, who are doing who are focusing very much more on the small end of the market but contactless. Um, and again, you know, it's horses for courses because apart from the operational side of it and how those payment devices and services fit into your business. Um, it, a lot of it can be down to purely commodity. You know, what are these costing? Um, they all have a different kind of cost structure. Some of them will charge you a particular pe- percentage with a transaction fee attached. Um, and if you're looking just to, to reduce your payments as low as possible, then you need to shop around. Uh, and again, uh, you know, the, the advice is to is to use someone like Operalis to do that work for you. Uh, and you focus on your own business. But there are, there are so many options. Uh, uh, and, you know, you know, to put cash, you banks don't want cash, do they? You know, so, no. so I remember, you know, taking cash up to the bank or whatever, you know, it, it becomes yeah. really expensive. So, so I suppose that, you know, we, we've got us, you know, because I know there is all this always, I suppose, in people's minds, if obviously if you're taking a £20 note over to, you know, over the bar or, you know, over the counter, that, that is twenty pounds, but it isn't because then you've got to think, well, how much is it costing me to put it into the bank? But they don't really think about that at that point. Whereas if you take twenty pounds off a card and it, you're paying, you know, whatever it might be, a percent, two percent of the transaction, then suddenly there, there's a, a, is it that mindset of people or, mm. or are people saying, you know what? Because I'll be honest, I very rarely you know, nowadays I, I'm I'm very much a, you know, contactless or you know card person. I I, I don't carry cash a great a great deal at all. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, yeah. you know, it, it it suddenly becomes this. Um, you know, it, 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 where where are the barriers? But but actually, where where are we going? Um, yeah. You know, personally, I think we are going like as you said already. There are places that are you know cashless. Yeah, there's a lot. You know, it, it, and and I, I think it, you know that that is probably where we're going to end up, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, I think so. I think you know people's lives are on the smartphones now, and I don't think that. The payment companies are stupid. I think they're all heading that way. But I would say also, you know, the restaurant sector is, you know, the oldest sector in the world. And I can't I can't quote the exact numbers, but there are circa 65,000 hospitality uh, entities in the UK. There's about 27,000 restaurants that you would class as restaurants, stroke QSR, stroke quick service. Um, but a, a very, very large proportion of those still ha- use a cash draw and mm-hmm. don't have any form of technology to take payment at all. So being mindful of that. But I think the world's changing and everything's going to be consumer-led. So if you want to maintain consumers coming into your business, people are going to have cash less and less and will rely on payment devices of some sort. Um, so, yeah, you, you see you see the rise of a lot of these um these what are class as SMB operators, you know, the small business operators who are uh, engaging with single site operator uh, brands. And, you know, it's just for, from, from a consumer perspective, it's just I just want to click a card, click a phone, pay for my goods. From a restaurant's perspective, having your transactions integrated into your till to make sure that all the cash is consolidated to the back end of your of your operation is is really helpful to make things clean. Um, and to automate as much as you possibly can, take away manual process. Um, mm. And online, what you also find is on, with online online ordering, for example, the the providers in that space are very different to the providers in with the in-store space. So the likes of Stripe, for example, Stripe and Braintree, which is owned by PayPal, and PayPal themselves as well, they're very prevalent online. So what you end up with as a merchant is you end up with a provider of in-store payment and a provider of online payment they're very different um, uh, because they operate in different spheres. There are some crossover. So I think Barclay Card and WorldPay, for example, do both online and in-store. But 
I would say almost de facto online payment providers nowadays are Stripe and Braintree because they they're built for the developer world for those online platforms. Uh, they fit very nicely into the platforms and um, give developers less hassle. So ultimately, I think those guys are. But, you know, from a merchant's point of view, it won't make any difference. We, we get a merchant ID, we plug it in, we turn it on, and payments appear in their bank within 24 hours. It's um, it's very straightforward. It's very straightforward. So it just means there's two providers to manage. But again, thing is, you know, it's not taking cash. That, that's the, the, the thing. You know, obviously, you you limit then. Obviously, you know um, theft. You know, if, you, if you're not taking everything else, there's a lot of things that you can obviously um, you know ensure that it doesn't happen. Um, what's it? We've, we've gone nearly um, you know 36 minutes without mentioning this. Obviously, with the current situation that we're in, yeah. Um, and obviously, when you you know you, you're going into some places now to to shop, and they they won't take cash. I think, you know, do you think the current situation is actually going to start to make people trust, um, you know, things like contactless payments? And are people going to be more fearful now of going back to cash because of, you know, of, of the whole, you know, COVID-19? Yeah. You know, is, is that going to be now, I think, should, should restaurant operators be thinking now for when they reopen? Um, yeah. actually, is the mindset of the consumer... Because um, I think there, there's certainly going to be a lot of things we can we'll, we'll touch on those in a minute. Mm. Um, but is that one thing? Do you, do you think that that's that got to be taken into consideration? I think the world's definitely changing, isn't it? I mean, it's it's hard to judge because I don't think in our lifetimes, so me and you, John, uh, we've never been in this situation, so we can surmise. Um, mm. We can we can we can guess at what we think is going to happen. But I think even now, I think without coronavirus, I think people were already erring towards contactless anyway. I think, you know, if I stand in a queue at a restaurant and people are, oh, sorry, at a takeaway, people are ordering food, they're typically tapping away, you know, very, very, I've seen very, very few, especially in London, very few with cash, but that is London. Yeah. Um, I think that the behaviour of consumers will definitely go towards, um, yeah, I think it's going to take a long time, not just in restaurants, but in, in retail generally, for consumers to get the confidence that a particular item that they're holding, a bag that they're holding, uh, a piece of cash that they're holding, is is free of infection. Mm-hmm. You know, I just think that there's, it's a, it's, a, it's a whole new world, isn't it? I just don't know. Yeah, I don't know yeah. wh- wh- where it's going to go. But certainly, um, on the restaurant side, uh, you're dealing with hygiene, and, and and hygiene and coronavirus is intrinsically linked. So I don't know what the behaviour is going to be. I don't know whether restaurants are going to open and suddenly no one's going to appear. Everyone's going to be ordering delivery. Um, I just don't know. I honestly yeah, can't yeah. predict that. Um, no, it's no. not an area of expertise for any of us because none of, none of us have experienced it. Well, right? Right. Yeah, I suppose those it's just trying to understand. You know, personally, I, I, I think that, that people will, you know, they'll want to get out after being cooped up for so long, you know, and, and not being able to. And I, I think there will be that opportunity. I, I think there's going to be quite mix like i say because some people are like well do you know what you know what why don't we just have friends around and we order something in yeah uh, but then others will want to get out and and be again in that you know that that social you know space and and i think you know so but so you know what what would you sort of give us some advice we, you know we sort of start to sort of wrap up now you know yeah. sort of what 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 would you kind of give operators and and people you know re- restaurant owners advice now that they can be doing in this kind of, you know, let's call it downtime, mm. um, to maybe get get their house a bit in order, ready for for for, for when you know for, for when we when they do reopen, um, you know, in terms of you know if they've got, you know, they might have EPOS systems in already, or is it? I'd expect most of them to have systems in already. So yeah. what 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 advice would you give that they can do to kind of, you know, so when it does get that they're a bit more efficient. Yeah. I mean, the first thing I would say, John, is that I think even during this period, um, talking to my a lot of my suppliers, especially around the online ordering area, they're seeing record numbers of restaurants and not just restaurants, but hotels as well that want to maintain operational capability um, and some form of revenue and also support for support workers like the NHS, for example. Um, they, they're looking for online ordering. And uh, I think in one particular supplier that I have, in a week had 140 new restaurants sign up which is unprecedented 
Um, so people already are looking for ways to enable consumers to engage with them. I know that high-end restaurants, for example, that are wanting to, to have their food delivered to keep kitchens open are turning to online ordering. Um, so I'd consider that. Um, I think, you know, when you look at uh, your internal processes, I think now is a good time to do it because life is hectic, you know, when you're open. Um, you, you're, you're open typically from lunchtime till late at night, depending on your type of concept. But so you only have you know, a few hours in the very early morning to, to try and really take a step back and look at how your business operates. Is it is it effective? Are you making the margins that you think you should be making? Are you actually controlling your consumers, your customers? Is 50% of your business delivery controlled by a third party? Um, and what does the future look like? You know, are you a lifestyle business that operates one unit and happy to live live that way? Do you want to, do you have ambitions to expand? If you do, as soon as you move to a second unit, there are lots of considerations around technology. And, um, and that's what I would be doing. I'd be looking at, you know, where's the future of this business? Where am I going? Um, and how do I engage? And I think, you know, just going back to the Operalis model, I mean, just not even Operalis, but the model itself, it's geared towards helping restaurateurs to make decisions because, and it's free advice. You know, we don't charge for our, our service because we make our money, obviously, on the supply of the goods. And, and, and sometimes there is no supply of, of services because following a health check, everything's fine. And understanding the supplies in the market there isn't really an improvement to be made anywhere. So it, it really is, for us, it's a bit of a numbers game. Um, we are here to help and make money at the same time. Um, and I think for restaurateurs, it's a case of what's my business doing? Can I optimise? Can I make it more efficient? Can I make more margin? Somebody give me some advice. And I think um, I think that's where we can we can step in and, and, and really support the sector. Um but yeah, there's no more to say than that, really, John. It's just a case of, you know, now's a good time, especially if you're closed, to yeah, really yeah, take yeah. stock and analyze where you are as a yeah, business. Yeah, yeah. I, I start, uh, see, kind uh, of answered one more be in that answer would always be, you know, kind of obviously we, we, we call it the disruptive restaurant. Uh, you know, what is disrupting the market at the moment? And I think, like you say, it's, it is this online ordering, it is the delivery model because of the situation we're in. Um, mm. So, just yeah. getting in touch with you. Obviously, they can go to your website, operalis.co.uk, and obviously all your details, contact details, and everything are on there. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, you know, um, Rob, it's, it's been brilliant. I think you've you've given us loads of value, and um, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, John. Really appreciate your time. No, not a, not a problem at all. Appreciate yours. Okay, thank you. Take care for now. Right, and you.